Well, good evening. And uh, I first want to congratulate the students because I know this is a genuine student uh, gathering. So I really want to congratulate you. You have done a great job and uh, taking care of everything. And I think you have put together a very interesting panel on energy. You also have a very good friends among them, Professor Terry Ling Carr, because we were together in, in San Francisco and she actually instructed me to come here and talk to you. And, uh, but we are very pleased to be here and uh, to share with you some of the ideas. I myself, I, I, I was linked with the with academia for, for many years at the university in Venezuela. But you know, with all the changes in my country from the 90s, I started getting involved in politics. And from 94, I've been very active in politics as my main activity. So I will try also to give you some of the experiences from the decision making and from the management of the sector. Uh, because uh, I was very much involved in Congress and then as uh, uh, in the Minister of Oil and Gas and, and the whole process of transition in Venezuela regarding oil. So I will try to um, tell you part of the human side of the story and the political side of the story. Well, we, we st I would like to start telling you a bit about how we see the energy crisis, the so-called energy crisis. Particularly because Venezuela and the US are very important players. We have the reserves, you have the market. But we have a different view about the energy crisis. And probably this is going to be the most important issue for the future. And we hope that we can be able to debate with the US, this topic of energy crisis. We believe that only through energy integration within the hemisphere, we will, we will have true energy security. So we are not looking at the problem from the point of view of Venezuela and the US, but we are looking at the problem from the the context of the region, South America, but also going to Latin America and the Caribbean. And actually, we have been doing a lot of things in this respect. Because apparently, the paradigm, the paradigm among many people in the US is that energy producing countries should exist, basically, to serve the voracious and often wasteful energy demand of the US. And basically, the concern is where are we going to get our sources of energy? And there are people that think that our role is basically to provide energy to this immense machinery of consuming energy, which is the US. But if we want to discuss really the energy crisis, and from our perspective, the need for access and affordable availability of energy for every country is the basis for the true security for all countries in the, in the region. So the problem is not only how we guarantee supply to the US, to the huge market of the US, but how we also guarantee access to energy to many, to the rest of, of, of the hemisphere. And this is the real, I mean, if we want to talk about real security, energy security in the hemisphere. And in that sense, we believe that there is a huge asymmetry in energy consumption 
And this is probably part of the inequalities we have among our countries. And the problem is we see that people don't talk about the pattern of consumption because they assume that it's impossible politically to try to change even the model or to try to discuss what is the kind of model of civilization we have in this part of the world. So this is one of the big problems and the big challenges we have. If current consumption patterns continue, developing countries will never have access to the energy they need to stimulate economic growth. Just in the case of Latin America, if we want Latin America to have the same level of consumption, imagine for a while that you wake up and you see Latin America with the same standard of living of the US, even with some of the inequalities that you have in this country, you will need an additional 20 million barrels of oil per day. Only if you get the countries of the hemisphere reaching the same kind of standard of living with the same pattern of consumption and the same, the same development, development, development and model. Because the problem is right now, talking about asymmetries, United States accounts for more than 70% of the energy consumed in the hemisphere. And it's only one third of the population. At the at World War level, the US is 3% of world population and consume 20% of its energy. One of the asymmetries, and this is something that the US has to start thinking seriously, is regarding the environmental aspect. CO2 emissions, the US account for 68% of the CO2 emissions in the hemisphere. And just to, for you to have an idea, Canada, which is second, is only 6.4. Mexico 4.3, Mexico Brazil 3%, and Argentina, Venezuela, and the rest of Latin America, and Argentina and Venezuela less than 1.5%. This is a huge, huge difference. And of course, if you're talking about energy crisis, you have to talk about availability of supply, access to supply, but you also have to understand the environmental issues which, by the way, is not only a concern of the US, it's also a concern of the producing countries as us. The US faced a crisis of production at the production level, and as you know, the crude production is in a clear decline since the 70s. And you have a huge problem in the refiner level with all the constraints at the production capacity level. Uh, and we all know that refinery, refining capacity in the US will reach its maximum level by 2008. Even ourselves, if you see the figures of Venezuela, Venezuela will reduce the export of crude oil to the US, not because we want to do it, it's because it is not capacity to refine more crude in the US. Actually, a country like Venezuela, if you see the energy relationship we have the, with the U.S., much more important than crude is refining product that we give to the U.S. because we have a huge refining capacity in our countries and in the Caribbeans. During Katrina, that was a very good example because during Katrina, U.S. Were, were, people were ex importing gasoline from Europe, but Venezuela is six five, between five and six days shipping time. While from Europe, you probably need 25, 30, sometimes 35 days. What, for us, the key to understand energy crisis and the ways out of energy crisis is the need for equilibrium. For us, the fundamental issue in energy is energy equilibrium how we get an equilibrium internally, externally. How can, for example, 
because when you look at producing countries, and I wanted to participate in the, in the panel because you were discussing internal politics or domestic politics of the producing countries. But uh, first, you have to understand that we have to reach an internal equilibrium. In producing countries, for example, we have a sec an, an, an oil sector of the economy that probably doesn't have anything to do with the non-oil sector of the economy because people think that those societies are only simple societies where all they have is oil production. That might be the case of some of our broader countries in the, in the Middle East, a country like, for example, Qatar. But if you see countries like Mexico, Norway, Venezuela, even Indonesia, uh, is different. So the first equilibrium is between the oil sector and the non-oil sector of the economy. In a country like Venezuela, people in the mountains, the only relation they have with oil is through fiscal income. While people working in the areas, they are more interested in becoming consultants or workers, engineering, or providing services to the oil companies. So they are not very interested in, in fiscal income. The only one is activity. But what happened with the rest of the country that is not, does not belong to what we call the oil economy? So those are equilibrium, domestic, internal equilibrium that are very important. Within a producing country, equilibrium means reducing asymmetry and increasing interaction between the oil and the non-oil sector of the economy. And if it is the case, we need, fair, we need a fair and steady fiscal income because it's only through fiscal income that we will benefit people from the oil wealth. In, my be, in, my, in, my, in, in our opinion, that equilibrium was very much damaged in the past 20 years with the imposition of a fiscal model that was giving privileges to the need of investors over the needs of the governments. And basically that was the program of the, uh, the oil exploration and exploitation in the North Sea. Because what happened is the idea was how we privilege the investors, because we want the investors to come to the North Sea. And basically what they wanted is more production. Consumers want as much production as possible. Producers have a different perspective. So you cannot try to impose a fiscal regime that represents the needs of the consumers to the producers. So what happened is, in countries like Venezuela, we start in the, seven, in the, in the 80s and in the 90s uh, dismantling our traditional fiscal regime and adopting this liberal, neoliberal, some people said, type of fiscal regime. And the result, and I would like to show you just one slide. No, no, not this one. This one. This is fiscal income by the government of a country like Venezuela. And as you see, royalties remain basically stable. Income taxes went very down. Why? Because there was a lot of expansion of our oil company. And as you know, when you expand an industry, is a it's a state who is paying 60% of that because they can use that for taxation purposes. And at the end, you have these dividends because people say, no, the government should get money only if the company is profitable. But we say, why? I'm the owner of the natural resource. If I allow you to come and exploit my resources, you have to pay me up front. That was the years in Venezuela when they changed the whole fiscal regime. 
I've been in politics for a while, and any politician here will understand that this is unsustainable. That trend goes parallel to the collapse of the Venezuelan former political regime. It was unsustainable. And also, it reflects, in our case, the predominance of the oil sector and the technocracy of the oil sector of the politicians. Because the idea was politicians are going always to be corrupt, they will spend the money badly, so the best way to do it is to give the, all the important decisions in the hands of the technocrats. This red thing you see, which is dividend, and I was in Congress as head of the, commi of the committee in, that, in those years, they have to borrow money to pay dividend to the government. Because of course, as prices were very much down, then the government at that time say, what happened? You promised me that everything was going to be great with this increase in production. Prices went down, and the money, the government did not have money for the first time even to pay for the payroll of the government. So the government asked the oil company to borrow money to pay the dividends, which is, from an economic point of view, something crazy. You never do that. You take dividends only if there are profits. So for us in Venezuela, the first big thing we have done is to reestablish the equilibrium and to get to levels of fiscal income that allows you to keep the internal equilibrium. At the external level, you can take that out. Equilibrium among producer, consumers, or industry has to be reached. And this is as important as the internal equilibrium. For example, when we came to government in Venezuela, OPEC has, was having a very, very difficult times. Not only because they were internal fight between the Arab countries and some of the Middle East countries, but also because it was, no, nobody trusts the other, because at the end it was the competing, your PEP countries were competing for finance, international finance and for investors. So the whole idea was to change your conditions, lower the royalties and the conditions because we were fighting for investment. And we started a very active process of discussion among OPEC that led us to the, uh, for, to the second head of state summit of OPEC in 25 years. That was a huge initiative. And I think uh, the whole idea of the price band, those years, I remember that we had a very good cooperation process with the US authorities, Mr. David Goldwyn, that you, he was the, the international uh, undersecretary of, of energy, and, and, and Mr. Richardson. And we start discussing that we have to coordinate and find some equilibrium. And as you know, with prices of $7 per barrel, we had those prices, there was no investment. And then we had the problems in the, in the, in the coming years of that. So, but at the same time we say, well, we have to talk to consumers. And we have to talk also with the non-OPEC producers. So, managing something like energy. At the end, of course, market forces play a very important role. But at the end, for us, if you want to talk about security, you have to start coordinating and trying to understand what kind that you need to reach an equilibrium between producers, consumers, people in producing countries, industries, etc. The US, by the way, is a very good example because in the US there is always a combination of a producer and a consumer. If you go and to Texas, you will find yourself as, as, as coming from a producer country 
I, at home. But what happens if you go to California, where the whole discussion of environment is completely different? Oh, of course, if you go to Detroit and then you see the manufacturers of, of cars, you know that you are talking with your potential market, okay? But at the same time, there are other forces in the U.S. So U.S. is a very interesting uh, uh, society because you combine that. Also, the problem of taxation. I remember once, uh, that's a story for you, we were discussing with the British government. I was representative of Venezuela in OPEC, and the Minister of uh, Energy Minister of Saudi Arabia, he was talking to the authorities of the British government, and they were discussing about the prices of oil, and the, the Saudi minister, he said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, you know, let's do something. I'll give you all the oil you need for free. I'll put it in, your, in, in, in England, and you give me half of the taxes. Because at the end, countries like, for example, France, if you spend a liter of gasoline in France, you're paying 90% in taxes. 90% in taxes. By the way, we thought that those taxes was, were, were intended to do major environmental changes. But at the end, we knew that they were financing public health in those countries. So this is another thing we can do, we have to do. We start discussing the whole issue of what we call the non-physical market of oil. We were accused a lot. When you see WTI in the newspapers every day, production of WTI today in the world is less than one million bars per day, basically in the US. The rest of the production, the open basket, is basically of heavy, medium, heavy crude oil. And we get probably 10 or 11 or 12 dollars less than what you see as WTI. But then if you go to the markets, financial markets, you know that every day they trade millions of barrels of non-existing oil, not physical oil. So we have also said that at least there is an influence of eight, nine, ten dollars in the prices of oil related to this financial capital involved in a whole process of speculation regarding non-physical oil. Those are things that we as producers, we talk. And the refining factor, for example, we send it the US government and the US Congress since two years ago a whole this proposal and a whole document to discuss the refining problems. Because, as I said, in the US, you will reach full capacity in 2008. We, we are estimating that we are reducing the export of crude oil to the US because there won't be capacity. By the way, don't think that we are going to do that because of any political retaliation, nothing to do with that. So, don't you think that we are talking about issues of, any, of a, such an importance that deserve that we find ways of having a strategic discussion? And the whole thing should go beyond uh, the classical way of looking at things. And let me tell you, I get disappointed sometimes because any time there is a new discussion about energy, everybody wants to talk about energy. At the end, nobody wants to raise the real questions. And particularly, one question that I want to raise with you is, are we ready to discuss the model of development? Are we ready to discuss that one thing is the supply of the US, and that's important, but at the same time, unless we give access to energy to other countries, unless we try to correct the asymmetries in our countries, there won't be security for, for any of, of, of us. Those are the kind of questions that I think we have to start discussing. I don't know, Fadis, if we have the picture of the lights. No, no. Imagine for a second that you, because at the end we said to the other countries in the world, 
from the Western. Follow our model of society. By the way, including democracy. Uh, allow me, with respect to this country, we are not going to get all the uh, features of the U.S. democracy. For example, I always get, and I tell that with respect to the U.S. public, but I don't understand how can you call the democracy how can you explain a democratic government that at the same time you need to have $20 million just to think of being a senator? I don't know. I, I really, that amazed me. It means that only certain kind of people could be elected. So I'm sorry, this is not an open democracy, at least in elections. There might be other features. But anyway, it's tempting, but I, I will concentrate in energy. <laughs> but anyway, the idea is, if you go and reproduce the kind of society that we have here, this is possible. Our estimates are, if that is going to be the case, remember Latin America will need $20 million barrels per day. But look. Imagine that we do that in Africa, in Asia. We probably will need four additional planets of, human res of, of natural resources. So, two possibilities. We are lying to these guys. It's impossible. We, will, we have to be, we have to understand that we will live in a very asymmetric, asymmetric world and worse and geopolitical confrontation will be there because there is not enough natural resources to fuel that kind of development. Or we have to sit down and discuss the issue of development model, the model of civilization, etc. And this is a real question that not many people want to answer, and particularly some people in the US when they only want to see at their own problem. And I understand that they might be concerned, I respect that. But I mean, we need from the political uh, and, and Congress and, and, and academia to raise those, because everybody wants to talk about globalization. But when you talk about energy, no, there is no globalization. All I need is what I'm going to get my resources. So globalization means also that we have to discuss what is happening in the rest of the countries. Cheap oil, of course, you won't see cheap oil. At least it, the, the prices we, we, we used to know. And something which is important is that over the next 25 years, there are studies from some people at Syracuse University, the number of net oil exporting countries will, be, will go from, 20, from, from 35 to 12. Indonesia is going to become a net importer. Mexico is going to become a net importer. So, from 35 to 12. The majority of them are going to be in OPEC. The other thing, national oil companies versus international oil companies. I think we have that, no, Fadi? The national versus the... And this is very interesting, because over the past 15 years, we have been huge changes. So who has the reserves? Before, it was the international oil companies. Now, it's the national oil companies. Don't forget that when OPEC was created, after that there was a whole movement to create national oil companies. Then there was a process of non-oil producers, non-OPEC producers, and basically international companies controlling the process. Now, at least in the case of reserves, so this is why at the end, international oil companies, they have to find ways of working with the governments. 
I'll give you an example, which is very important. What happened, and don't forget what I told you about the North Sea. There is an energy treaty in Europe. That energy treaty was signed as a frame for the new oil explorations in the former Soviet Union. The notion of natural resources disappeared. There is not mention to natural resources because the whole thing was a complete liberal model to guarantee the access of investment to produce the oil in the former Soviet Union. I'm afraid that the story, after a few years, has been very, very complex because they haven't, they haven't found what they, they expected. And at the same time, they, are, they have created great disequilibrium. And today what you see, and this is part of the reality, is a completely different view from the producing countries regarding natural resources. Bolivia, there have been a major political change in Bolivia. A native Bolivian was elected president of Bolivia for the first time in history. It's the same thing that if you were going to see tomorrow a president of Mexico, a native Mexican as president of Mexico. And the whole political situation and crisis in, Brazil, in, in Bolivia was around the natural resources issue. And what they have now is a new law. They have now the royalties. They are getting a fair price. And by the way, this is not an elite type of discussion. Because for us, producers, countries like Venezuela, now for the first time, there is an open discussion about energy, about oil. People discuss that openly. Before, it was a very elite kind of, of matter. And it was always kept as a, something for a very small group of people. So this is something which is happening now and will happen not only for oil. It will, it will, it will be the case for every natural resource. So this is something, this is a huge thing. And unless there is a process of negotiation, unless there is an understanding of that, and we think that the way to understand it is through this notion of equilibrium. Because unless you understand that you have to balance your interests, your need with the interests and need of people working with you, this is the only way. A sound oil policy is based on equilibrium. Of course, we producers, we cannot also break the equilibrium vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the investors. We have to, to, to work on that. And this is the most important thing. And we have to be ready to reestablish equilibrium if there are moments where we feel that we have broken the equilibrium. That's, that's what we have done in Venezuela. There is a lot of perception in the media. But look, we went through a process of changing contract, oil contract. You know how difficult is that? And people were saying two years ago that we were going to collapse. And we have changed. In the first phase, 35 contracts, which, which were, in our opinion, simulated concessions, illegal concessions. We negotiate with companies in the new law, and now they're minority partners of us. And out of 35, only two decided not to negotiate, and we are going through a process of arbitration, which is a normal process in business. And in the heavy crude oil, we have four big contracts, and we are negotiating with all companies. We will get back the majority of the project, and they will keep working with us. So that's possible to do it. By the way, Venezuela, who is being presented by many as a country impossible for business, again, with respect to my brothers of Mexico and Saudi Arabia, I want you, investors of the US, try to put one dollar in upstream activities in Mexico. No way. We, we allow minority participation in upstream to companies. Well, 
basically, then going back to the hemisphere and trying just to present my, the center of the thesis. Of course, in the, in also in the U.S. and the hemisphere, the U.S. has only 14% of the reserves, but consume 83 of total, 83 of total consumption. And in South America, that we have 86% of reserves only consume 40%. As I said, we probably will need, if we want to equate the kind of standard of living, 20 additional million parts per day. Uh, and of course, as I said, uh, we need to, to really change the pattern of consumption, particularly because in the, oil, in the US, crude oil will go up more than 30% by the year 2030. And regarding the biofuels fuels, there are estimated that only they might get to 2% of energy consumption of, of the US, which is important, but it's not significant when we are looking at the big, big, big picture. Uh, so US energy in, 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 independence is a myth. Actually, in, no country could go it alone, including the US. And again, we think that through energy integration, that is a way to get energy security and must be based on some principles. We understand that they have to be economic sense, but also the concept of solidarity, complementarity of interest, inclusion, and the recognition of the sovereign right, rights of each country. This is extremely important. And sometimes I feel that people, they know that the kind of development we are having in Latin America does not work. But when you ask them what they want to do, they present you the same recipe. It's like, you know, you agree that there is something is going wrong, but at, this, at the same time, you don't have anything else to offer. I think we have, there is a clear imbalance between public and private. By the way, this is part of the political crisis of our countries, because private interests took over, even political parties. And we used to have in our countries in Latin America political parties that have, has a clear sense of the public interest and the, the need to control and, 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 and the, the different private interests. But what happened with private interests became too powerful and took cover government. And of course, in our countries, what we have is when you think that there is no alternative, they simply do, they do not negotiate. And at the end, we have had all those kinds of things that in the case of Venezuela is incredible because we have a country that at the end was in a situation that even politically, the big fight we have had in Venezuela is the fight we have with the technocracy controlling the oil industry in Venezuela. Those people decided to stop production, to cut production because of political reason. So the ideology that was involved, because when you have institutional weakness, then only probably the military or people in, in an industry like the oil industry could become powerful enough. It's amazing. Nobody has mentioned that here. The case of Venezuela is incredible. For the first time in history, the technocracy of an oil company conducted a coup d'etat against a democratic government. By the way, those guys were sharing all the values of the World Bank, uh, uh, free market, open economy, the, even some of the notions of elite democracies. And look what happened. This is, this is something which is very important to, to mention. Finally, how we see, and we can have some time for Q&A, uh, I mentioned you the role of us, of Venezuela, in trying to reestablish an equilibrium. Let me just, for example, tell you something. When we came to government, it was impossible to find 
a secretary general for OPEC. Imagine what does it mean sitting down in a, in a meeting and if there, is a, if there was a proposal by Saudi Arabia, Iraq is veto. If there was a proposal by Libyans, the other people veto. If there was a proposal by Saudi Arabia, then Iran a veto. And Venezuela was probably the only significant player outside the region. And when we made the changes in our oil policy, and we went back to the tradition policy, oil policy of Venezuela, trying to correct the problems of the past, Venezuela gained a great credibility among OPEC. And this is why we were elected. Venezuela elected Secretary General of OPEC. And we promoted a whole set of new uh, initiatives, among others, the so-called dialogue between consumers and producers which is, I think, one of the most important events of the past years. In Latin America, we are, again, so far, energy policy in Latin America has been oriented basically to find new sources of energy to be supplied to the US. If you go and see the programs of the Inter-American Bank, all they want is how do they lend money to companies to produce more oil in Ecuador, in Peru, whatever, to try to supply the need for the U.S. in the future. We think that this is a very narrowed policy, and at the end, if we are talking about security, does not address the real security problems in the hemisphere. Again, I would like for you to think for a second. We have the reserve. If we have an agreement with the U.S., we will have the market, and probably the, the U.S. will have the reserve, huge reserves in Venezuela. 90% of the reserves in the hemisphere are in Venezuela. We might be solving the problem of the U.S. We might be solving the problem of Venezuela. Are we solving really the problems of the region? Are we really promoting a more secure place in the hemisphere? Are we really promoting a human uh, phase of development? What are we going to do with poor countries that they don't have access to energy, et cetera? So we went the other way. And we have promoted a huge process of integration. For that, we need a new balance between private and public. We are not against private participation, but there are decisions and initiatives that could be only be undertaken by the states. By the way, we have privatization in the past. In some cases, we failed. And for example, I give you two examples. Uruguay and Argentina. Uruguay have a refinery. We help them with the refineries. They're paying back to us with IT technology, agricultural technology, and we have invited the Uruguayans to produce with us oil in Venezuela to be sent to Uruguay. The same with Argentina. The same with Brazil. The same with Chile. By the way, as you see, ideologically different countries, I mean, different positions. With Colombia, which is presented as a, uh, at least they have an economic uh, program different from us. We are integrated, and we have a pipe between Venezuela and Colombia, and we might even go, go up to Panama. And we have, the most important thing is proposed to Latin America to sign an energy treaty. Not an agreement, a treaty. Signed in the frame of the new organization called the South American Union of Nations, through which there will be a lot of initiative already existing, uh, like uh, the, the, the building of a pipeline, gas production. Uh, uh, of course, we also have to take uh, uh, care energy efficiency, alternative sources of energy. But basically, that treaty will guarantee to every country on South America the access to supply. And it will be part of a political and legal commitment through an international treaty. Those are the kind of things that we believe that are necessary. 
if we want to really address the situation. Of course, that means first that we'll start thinking outside the box. I understand sometimes we speak about these ideas, and I have friends and good, good friends of us that, because they have not been discussing that, they, they think that this is crazy, how, how governments, governments are corrupt, inefficient, whatever. And, 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 but I, I mean, the only way of, of really trying to, to, to address those issues is precisely that. For example, I'll give you examples of, you know, my, our decision making process. When we came in government, we knew that we have to fight for fair prices of oil. But we knew that there were some countries that they were going to complain. Of course, because US can pay that. Europe can pay that. But what happened with Jamaica? What happened with Haiti? What happened with Nicaragua? So at the same time we say, okay, how much energy do they need? Why don't we go through a process of financing part of the energy bill? So we put together a program through which we give them financing of a significant part according to the prices of oil of their oil bill. But then we say, why don't we go beyond that? And we try to promote a development fund that will help, sell, help solving other problems related with energy. Infrastructure, basic infrastructure, for example. Refineries, because all of those in that infrastructure was lost during this privatization process. So those are the kind of things that we think are important. This is an ongoing process. We think that there is a role for the US to be played there. It's a, it's a role for the US to be played in the world, but in the region. If there is a single issue that could help, it's a very good measure of the situation of the world and all the problems, environmental problems, logistics, geopolitical, war, peace, inequalities, development, is energy. So I think this is a clear issue where we have to see, sit down and try to really negotiate among us a new frame, a new frame. And, uh, and this is what we have been working in the region. Uh, of course, and, and as I said to you, for us, our, the, the most important thing is to, to work together in this notion of equilibrium. And I think the U.S. have to understand that if you want to be secure with democracy and peace, you have to address the issues of equilibrium. Because if you have a balance where there are more chances of a peaceful, democratic and a development and future for all of us. Thank you very much and open to questions. Hi, Ambassador. My name is Carlos Sucre. I'm a citizen of Venezuela. I have a question not related to energy, but I would like for you to comment on it. Um, about a week ago, El Nacional published uh, an order, a copy of an order by the Commander-in-Chief of the, of the Armed Forces signaling that now officers have to salute not only with the military salute, but also saying, Patria Socialismo o Muerte. Mm -hmm. Does that, in your opinion, signal the strength of Venezuelan democracy under Chavez, or is that a clear sign of indoctrination of the armed forces? Thank you. I think uh, you have answered your question. Because it's not a question, it's a statement you have made as a question, but don't worry. First, I have to see, because in the media, in Venezuela, you get an amount of incredible stories that some of them are unbelievable. I don't know, I, in Washington, I have uh, Mr. Kabul, he worked with me. We have a few generals, and we have a couple of almirants, we have surgeons, we have um, a significant numbers of, uh, of military people. And Fadi, have you seen them doing that? I, I don't really believe that. Don't believe everything you see there. Uh, hello, Ambassador. 
Um, I was, uh, you talked a lot in your speech about uh, needing a new model of development and that, you know, development as sort of developed nations have made it is not sustainable uh, for, you know, the rest of South America and for Africa because they're so oil, in oil intensive. I mean, you can comment on um, Venezuela's chosen model with really heavy subsidies to gasoline, making, I mean, gasoline costs something like 25 cents a gallon mm -hmm. in, in Caracas. Um, and what, what kind of model is that really setting for you know, yeah, the rest of, of the course. world? Yeah, of course. You are mentioning only one specific point of a model. And that is part of the, I remember uh, the lady, one of the ladies that was talking, there, there are traditions in Venezuela. If you live in Venezuela, the tradition of uh, cheap oil, for cheap gasoline is incredible. Even governments, any government, they think that if they increase it, the, the prices of oil, the prices of gasoline, the whole thing will collapse. And uh, from a technical point of view, it doesn't make sense. And particularly if you are, if we are serious in trying to change also the way we are doing consumption. We have done, for example, something which is very important. We have replaced 50 million, uh, how do you say it? Bulbs, no? For uh, saving energy bulbs. It's uh, equal to a whole uh, electricity plant, a big one. It's incredible. We have done that but it's impossible to increase the prices of gasoline. Do you, do you believe that uh, President Chavez's uh, government would like to move toward increasing the price of gasoline? Yeah, well, we, we have, I've been there, I presented to him when I was in the government like four or five, uh, and, and uh, because even uh, there is also uh, something with the, with, the, um, with the people that working at the gas stations. I mean, they have to increase, they cannot increase the price of a gasoline, but they have more cost. So we are even giving more money to them as subsidies, not only to the people, but also to the business people. I mean, to the people that works in the distribution system. There is a plan, last time I went there, and they are going to increase it. I mean, there is on the table, there is a huge campaign. They have presented the campaigns with a liter of gasoline. You can buy 10 boxes of cigarettes with a liter. I mean, you know, they compare, and it was a very successful but again, the thing is when you have a very, when you have a political sensible situation, there is always use that as a political tool. And, and it has been that uh, ever since. But again, you are right. This is one of the big challenge of Venezuela that, uh, I mean, if we are proposing this new approach to energy, and particularly that we have to transform the way we are looking at civilization, etc., we also have to do it ourselves, and uh, this is uh, this is one of the of the of the issues. As I said to you, we have been doing a lot of things. For example, in gas, transforming to gas, and huge investment in hydro. But again, this is a, this is a problem. You are right. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'd like to know a little bit about uh, Venezuela's position on Chinese. Uh, foreign investment, particularly in Africa, and if you think that is a uh, sustainable or an equitable model of development? What happened, our experience, our experience with China is, uh, is very interesting. Uh, by the way, it's, 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 it has been there for a while, because I remember when President Chavez was elected, President Caldera, the former president, he did few initial steps. But uh, when we, Chavez was elected, uh, the first trip he went outside was going to countries like India, China, Iran, uh, some countries in Europe, telling basically that he wanted to relate to other medium sized countries with, with uh, and of course, China is a huge, with a more independent uh, uh, vision. And we started working with them. And uh, this is growing. And after Venezuela started doing that, I, I remember that there was a study by the Inter-American Bank, because they were taking the experience of Venezuela. Uh, um, Prime Minister Jan Semin, the first visit he did to Latin America was first Venezuela, then Brazil. And then he has been, they have been traveling a lot. Basically, we will cons consolidate with there a certain, uh, an important uh, market for, for oil, we, we, we are sending them uh, 150,000 barrels per day. We have found ways of making uh, 
economically uh, interesting. And what happened with, with, with Chinese is they help you with a lot of your development projects. This is one of the problems we have with the US, for example, which is basically business, private business based. Because Chinese, they could come with you and then you can tell, well, we, we want to build houses. We want to finish a part of our, our railroad system. We need some water plants, uh, water supply plants, etc. So we have within like 10 or 15 big projects that the government of, of China, through companies, Chinese companies, have been working with us. So the first time, um, in, the, in the first place, for us, it was an alternative, um, a new consumer. We, uh, we, uh, we thought it was very important because it's a, it's, we are diversifying our sources, our clients, but basically because we wanted to have a strategic relationship with China. And it's, it's based, of course, it has a geopolitical consideration, but basically because it's a way of helping us in some of the development models we are promoting. The same we hope to have with China, with Iran, that there has been a lot of discussion here about Venezuela and Iran. Basically what we are having with Iran is also taking advantage of the huge potential of Iran as an industrial, medium-sized industrial power to help us in, in Venezuela. We have milk, milk, milk plants, we have cars, tractors, we are providing tractors not only to Venezuela, but also now to Bolivia and Ecuador. So those are the kind of bilateral relationship that we have built with those countries. Uh, thank you. I have a question regarding your so-called equilibrium interpretation of uh, uh, foreign policy in oil. Um, how will your increasingly despotic government provide equilibrium to other countries that need your resources if you place an exorbitant volume of constraints? Uh, will that not scare off um, potential investors and hurt the Venezuelan economy in the long term? Well, first, I didn't catch your, 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 your but you say despotic. Yeah. I don't agree with that. I think you, there are no basis. Uh, I mean, this is, a, this, this, is a, this is a serious conversation among people in an academic. And uh, I mean, if you start just putting qualifying I'm, I'm people, polls, well, but uh, I can give you other polls also, where people in Venezuela are happy, they feel that the future is bright. I don't know, it depends. Well, I don't know if you, if a guy who has been re-elected with 1.7 million more votes than the first time, I don't know what pool are you looking at. But anyway, so the, the, the question, the center of the question was? Um, with the exorbitant volume of constraints on uh, exchange of energy resources, um, how will that... Okay. Uh, Well, again, my friend, I think you, with, with respect, and, and we can give you more uh, through my, my staff here, some more information, but it's only uh, adjectives. How do you say that? Yeah, I mean, uh, exorbitant constraint. Talk to the companies. All the companies are working with us. ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Harvest Resources, Star Oil, Repsol, Total Fina. All of those guys are signing memorandums with us, accepting our conditions. So I think you are not right. I mean, but anyway, we'll give you all the information about companies. The best way for you to clarify that is talk to the companies and tell them if they consider, because if they consider that they are exorbitant, blah, 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 I don't know, they, they should have left the country, I don't know, years ago because we have really changed the conditions. And that, that's not easy for a, for, a, for a country to do it, and we have to do it because that was the only way to guarantee stability. I mean, guarantee, to guarantee stability in our countries is not to have foreign investment necessarily alone, 
No, it's how you make a balance between your, your, your needs as a government, the needs of your people, etc. Um, I want to respond very briefly to the previous speaker comment about polls. I think there was an article in the New York Times last week which uh, cited Hugo Chavez as one of the most popular presidents in, in the Americas uh, with an approval rating of, um, I'm not sure if I remember this correctly, but over 60%. So it really depends on which polls you're looking at, just as the ambassador said. Okay, um, but now to my question. Uh, my question relates to um, the nationalization of oil and gas um, uh, companies. Um, Ambassador, you mentioned Bolivia as an example. Um, I'm somewhat more familiar with uh, the Bolivian example than with the Venezuelan example. Um, um, the nationalization of the uh, Bolivian hydrocarbons industry, which started uh, uh, last year after uh, Evo Morales uh, took office as the first indigenous president of that country, as you already mentioned, um, has come under uh, attack by both the left and the right in Bolivia um, as not going uh, far enough to the more radical left and as going too far to the, to the right. Um, um, my question is, um, since, since uh, President Hugo Chavez mentioned the term nationalization um, quite recently, I believe, um, how does the nationalization project um, of Venezuela compare to the nationalization project of Bolivia? And I'm uh, particularly interested in the issue of fair pricing, which you also mentioned. Um, what is fair pricing? Um, how is nationalization structured in Venezuela? Um, you mentioned royalties. Uh, you mentioned um, oil taxation. Um, now, the argument uh, from the, the, the um, uh, left in Bolivia is um, transnational companies keep their export prices artificially low. Let's say Texaco. Texaco brands Bolivia. Well, it sells to Texaco U.S., and it sells at a much lower price than, you know, consumers will pay for it. So um, the nationalization project of Evo Morales has been ridiculed by uh, some sectors of the left in Bolivia as, well, what kind of nationalization are you really talking about? You know, you don't go far enough. Uh, you don't get to the core of the problem. So, uh, can you address yes, this issue well, and, and how to compare? To the yes, yes, thank you. And, you know, of course, um, regarding uh, Bolivia, um, uh, I mean, we, at the end, is, is for Bolivians, according to their, their, their own assessment and evaluation, um, we, at least, we did it in phases. For us, it's not, it was not easy. As I said to you, we have to go through an oil sabotage. For the first time, the managers of the company, they decided to stop the company. They don't like President Chavez. That's okay. I mean, you, you might not like it, but you, you, are, you, are, you, you run a company. You cannot stop a company because you don't like a president. We did it through phases. We have uh, helped them in the sense of telling them our experience. I'll give you an example, which is very important because you are we have to go through a whole process of reframing the oil policy. First, royalties. Uh, having as our basis royalties. I don't know how can you say, we, we use, President Chavez used to have a very Venezuelan uh, way when he said royalties means, uh, Father, if you can help me with my translation, Chihuahua al corral fuerte al sombrero. It means that, I mean, you give me what is mine up front. Because the problem is with the other system, you go and you get your fiscal income at the end of the value, of the value chain. When you are the owner of natural resources, you are entitled to have a patrimony. A patri this is your patrimony. And you are entitled to have some up front just for people going and, and using your land. This is the principle of a landlord in the history. But you are right regarding prices. You know what we did? When I came to be uh, in the Minister of Energy, uh, Oil and Gas, 
I remember that I start looking at uh, shipments between Padevesa and Sitgo paying $1.5 per barrel. Because what happened is those guys, they use internal transfer prices to get loans in the US to buy the refineries and the whole payment was related to the cash flow. And you needed to have a certain cash flow. When prices were down, we have to give them discount because it was, was the only way to pay back. What we did, and it cost us three years of work, is to create what we call a price committee. Even to PDVSA, which is our national oil company, and to all the international players in Venezuela, they have to pay us market prices. We have somebody who tell us, you can then charge to your company in your internal books whatever you like. But to me, my income, my royalties and my income taxes are based on market prices. That, was, that created a great problem uh, uh, because, I mean, the whole structure of these corporate companies is based on that. I, I think, uh, uh, by the way, the process of nationalization in Venezuela was a renationalization. And by the way, it's not a full nationalization because we have allowed companies to participate to a certain level. <clears throat> in the case of Bolivia, they have been speeding up the process. For us, it was a process that took us, well, eight years. Eight years. And for us, is first you have to establish, you have to establish the sovereign right, and then you have to establish the control the control over your natural resource. Because what happened in our countries is we created a private, a, a, a public company, and at the end, they were doing the role of the government. Because instead of being a concessionary, subject to supervision, they became the administrators of the natural resource. That was a whole confusion in the case of Venezuela. So we have done it that, that uh, way. So for us, from the very beginning, it was very important first to control production, to measure production. It was a fight. I was almost killed because I wanted to have my own way of measuring oil production. And the guys in the former PDVSA, they did not, did, didn't accept that I did that. I said, I wanna see, I'm the owner. I have the right to see how much oil are you producing. So we start from production, reestablishing royalties, then changing the whole uh, system of income taxes, and particularly, as you said, controlling the, the company and, and giving the privilege to the, uh, energy, uh, the, to the minister, to the government, because at the end, on the one hand, we are the owner of the resources, but we are also the representative of the shareholders in the company. So it has been a very interesting process. I hope that it will be easier for the Bolivians because we have done a lot of things previously. I think there is a, another thing that they didn't have a, a, such a strong structure in the oil sector as we had in Venezuela. It was a whole corporation with a whole mentality, with a lot of political power, media power, uh, international power. So it was difficult for us and I hope that it will be different there. I think the issue of natural resources is different now. I think companies understand, and, and people more and more, they understand that you, you have to accept that there should be, a, a, you have to reestablish a, a, a proper relationship between the owner of natural resources and, 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 and the business. And, and I think there is a more and more the awareness that this is a reality. Uh, they're doing, I mean, some people are, uh, are surprised because uh, Evo Morales has shown that, uh, I mean, he has a plan and uh, he is doing, uh, I think he has been important also uh, uh, Brazil because the problem with companies is not that you are against Europeans, Latin Americans, uh, US companies. I mean, in, in, in Bolivia, what you have is Petrobras, which is a Brazilian company. The whole thing is not that you, because of the nationality of the company. No, it's because of the roles. 
on the one hand of the state, on the other hand of the economy, the regulation power of the government, the control over the process, and this is what we have been reestablishing. I assure you that the model implemented as part of this neoliberal uh, uh, models in Latin America regarding energy is a failure. Regarding energy, it has been very difficult because at the end, the companies end up in the, in the hands of financial capital. We were discussing with some companies, electricity companies, and at the end, for them, it's a business. It's a financial business. For countries, I, I'll give you an example after the last question, I hope, or I think. If you see the US, you can put a molecule of gas in Florida, and there is pipes to take it to the state of Washington in Seattle. Who did that? Policies, government policies. So we need to have infrastructure policies that allows us to have a real integration in our countries. Are we going to still have only the classical integration towards the ports as the classical export, import, export uh, societies? Or are we going to promote a different kind of integration? In Latin America, in South America, we have a balance. We could have an energy balance in South America. There is a balance between different uh, sources of energy. We have markets and we have producers. Enough energy, enough reserves. So now we need to put that together for a development plan, as they did here, as they did in Europe. So this is our challenge right now. And not a private company is going to go and to do what the governments have to do. It also means that you are not going to allow them to participate. They have to participate with you. But basically, you need first a clear policy frame by the governments. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, this is a question not about uh, your own domestic internal policy in your country, but rather um, the, uh, the trade of, of petroleum on the world market. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, we have trillions of, many trillions of dollars uh, of goods traded throughout the world. And, uh, and those trades take place without government to government deals, but rather through a broad framework. And, uh, and quite frankly, if I look at the entire amount of OPEC export revenues, you know, it's only a few hundred billion dollars today. Uh, why, uh, and, 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 and I guess often, and you also use this term, energy security. I mean, we don't have clothing security. Uh, you know, none of us want to go naked. Uh, but, you know, we're willing to be dependent upon China for a good fraction of our clothing market. We have steel that we import, automobiles that we import. Um, why, why do you believe that uh, it's relevant or important that we have government-to-government -government deals? For example, Japan trying to have a deal with Russia to get its oil, Russian oil, to uh, the Pacific as opposed to go to China. China fighting Japan. Japan making a special deal with the Iran uh, in the midst of all this uh, uh, concern with uh, nuclear weapons development there uh, to develop its field, as if the oil should have a Japanese flag uh, tied to it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it seems that, that uh, Venezuela is going down the same path. Uh, uh, you can sell oil to China. You don't have to have a government-to-government -government deal. So uh, I'd like you to uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I comment on that. No, 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 it's okay. L let me tell you something. At least in the case of, uh, of Latin America, we haven't done much in energy integration. Energy integration up to now has been basically, and although energy integration was part of the Summit of the Americas, Venezuela was the co-chair with US and Mexico, I remember. But we haven't done much. Among other things, because Latin America was not, we were not looking at regional integration, we were looking at how 
can I get to the U.S. market, for example, and benefit to access the U.S. market. There are failures, and there is, I think, in the case of Latin America, a new interest in trying to balance private-public uh, responsibilities. I'm talking about countries like Brazil. And for example, I think it's key to understand that the mentality of President Lula, because I think this is a clear Brazilian president that is putting as the priority the integration in South America. And he has a lot of credibility and I mean, without Brazil, it will be very difficult. Uh, private companies in our countries, they don't have the power to relate to in huge projects. Because at the end, all private companies in Latin America, there are very few, and they have been, they, some of them have been taken over by European or big transnational corporations. So I don't think that we have a, a private sector in Latin America that, that could lead a process of regional integration with the appropriate policies. Because at the end, as you said, the solution could be there is the policy, the whole, the whole policy. So you invite people to participate. And it might be a role by international companies. In Venezuela, the, in Latin American, the experience is we don't have. Big Latin American private consortiums were privatized or were, were sold to international or to consolidated conglomerates. And um, for example, the company in, in Argentina. And now what you have is uh, some oil, state oil companies, including, for example, uh, Colombia, that people forget that there is an important uh, public sector oil company in, in Colombia. Venezuela, of course. Uh, Bolivia is going back because the, the, the company in Bolivia was privatized, giving this famous golden share, which is at the end doesn't mean anything. Um, Argentina, Uruguay was about to sell ANCAP, and then with this new reality, they have kept ANCAP as part of the government. So I agree with you that we have to be open and flexible to understand. My reaction right now is that it's difficult to, to, in the case of Latin America, if you don't have, have government policies and even government itself pushing for that. Because at the end, companies could not make the decision if they are only based on a portfolio of investment they can have all over the world or if they don't get what they expect they have to gain. For example, refineries. Refining is a very tricky and difficult business. So are we going just to forget about refineries or we're going to, to try to promote and, and some cooperation to have refineries? We are going to do that with other countries, even with Paraguay and countries in the Caribbean like Jamaica and Cuba, uh, etc. At, at the world level, Europe is very much the, the, the governments and, and, and state in many European countries are very powerful. In France, at the end, if you want to talk to Total, they play a role, but at the end, the, the French government has a lot of power. Uh, Russia, that was in the hands of private sector, now you have uh, that in a way is going back to, to the government of, of Russia. And, and, and in Europe, I think there is a, a, a lot of coordination in policy. We don't see necessarily that we have to have uh, agreements government by government to government, but it makes sense that if you talk about, if our vision, if this vision we are presenting, that this is a strategic issue that, have to, that we have to address some asymmetries, and unfortunately only through free market and economic policy you are not going to reduce that asymmetry. They're, they're huge, some of them. So they have to be a common responsibility of us. And that means that governments or international organizations have to be involved in that, in that process. And uh, again, in the case of Latin America, we don't see any 
Latin American private capital that has the ability or the, the economic power to, to, to lead the process of, of this magnitude. Um, we have had some uh, restraints for, for, for investment. Fortunately, there are now, as you know, countries in Latin America, big countries, they have uh, gained a lot of independence and, and, and autonomy regarding these monetary policies after they, they negotiate and they finalize their relationship with the International Monetary Fund. And uh, now we are proposing the Bank of the South, as you know, is to create our own bank. And uh, it's, it's going to help. And, uh, and, and, and we are even proposing an idea of Petro America, where it's going to be like a frame of, of all the initiative needs uh, and, and ways of working together. A, a final word is when you talk about companies, international company, uh, companies, we have to be careful because people looked a lot to companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron, etc. But people don't, sometimes they don't look at the service companies. Let me tell you, there are three companies in the world that concentrate 85% of the service the services in energy. There has been a process of concentration in those three companies, huge, that is creating problems even with the companies. Now there is lack of engineering services. You don't file RICs. We are, by, we are building 20 or something RICs in, 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 in China. And they will be ready for next year because it's impossible. I mean, we, we, we were in a process of bidding and we need something like 42 rigs and we only get 10. Because at the end, is a concentration among those companies that control services. So, for example, we have been proposing in Latin America that we, ca we have to create a, a Latin American company of oil services. By the way, it should be private. I mean, it doesn't have to be public. Uh, we have done that in the case of offshore uh, technology in Venezuela, and now we are producing for the first time the platforms with Venezuelan companies for offshore oil. But again, it it's, has to be a huge process. It's, it's when, you know, what we feel is that you are talking about the energy integration. It's like when the people were talking about European unity. Union. I mean, this is a huge strategic decision by many governments and, 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 and societies. And, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, we are optimistic. I think for the first time there is a good prospect of success in this new...